Knowledge is power. And this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731 1230. That's 731 1230 or toll free. Toll free. 1 866 820 5528. That's 1 866 820 KLAV. Now let's fire up the news hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Welcome to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I am Kurt Dukach. Uh, with me in the studio today, we have Raymond Fletcher, Beach, Perry Haichu, and Lawrence on the boards making us sound good. So. Uh, today we got a very special show. We have a guest on the show today a uh, little bit later, Jeff Blank, the president of Reno Sparks Branch NAACP, and he'll be talking about the NAACP support of legalizing marijuana in Nevada. So um, on to our local news. Uh, we had a great- Hol- holidays party this past weekend at a great location, great event. I mean, easy access from public transportation. Yeah, and it, it went over really well. It was a it was a fundraiser potluck. Uh, we probably had close to a hundred people show up throughout the day. And, Easily. Uh, yeah, and we raised almost a thousand dollars to help the patients of Nevada. So it was overall a great day. So thank you everybody for yes, coming out. So all much. all of our uh, weekend members, all of our uh, guests that come out. Thank you. We couldn't do this. We couldn't help patients out if it wasn't for you. Yep, Valerie Ray, our two new members that joined on Saturday. So, yep. Um, in other news, what do we got? We got tomorrow. Uh, we have Hempy New Year coming up, isn't it? This is going to be our last broadcast of the year. Yep, it is. is. Mm-hmm. Another year in the books. Yeah, and it has been a monumental year with everything that we have accomplished, and it's going to be an even bigger year in the coming legislative session. Biggest year in cannabis ever, I would say. You know, every, everybody's going to be opening up. And speaking of opening up, the judge, uh, uh, a district court judge, Kathleen Delaney, has denied an injunction sought by medical marijuana applicants who didn't receive licenses from the state. Her decision comes after a, a legal fight that began after the state approved licenses um, for individuals that unfortunately didn't get a green light from the city of Las Vegas or from Clark County. Some of those denied uh, decided to sue the state as well as a few of the other businesses. As a result of Friday's decision, Clark County uh, commissioners met on Monday to decide the final um, status of the state eight, as they kept referring to them. <laughs> the state eight. Yeah, the, there's the state eight. How and, cute. And the county eight. And the county eight. And then there's the 10 that got the things. The thing that really upsets me most about this is now they're going back down to 10 licenses. <laughs> which is what they originally were supposed to have. And then they fought and they said, we want 18, we want 18 because of the number of people. Yeah, disproportionate population and all that. You know, They took it from other communities. I know, but their argument was, oh, there's so many more people here in the tourist district and this and that. And, you know, we really need these to provide for the patients of this community and this and that. And and like you said, Kurt, here they are rolling back on what they had. Or what was what's that saying? Uh, careful what you wish for because you might get it. Well, they got their 18 and now they can't even hash out who the 18 are supposed to be. So what happens? Do the, do, are the patients just, or is the state just denied these other eight that we were promised or how does this eventually pan out? Well, that goes into my next story. Okay. My next story is the county commissioner's, uh, uh, what do you even call it? Zoning meeting yesterday. Okay. What they did was they revived the 57 applications that they had held in abeyance and they basically denied them all. They already, <laughs> um, uh, Clark County Commissioner uh, Tom Collins asked if uh, any of the applicants would be coming forward or anything, and County Commission Chairman Steve Sislak said, no, we've had our hearings. This is our debate. What are we going to do? Well, here's a thing from Clark County's legal counsel, Marianne Miller, said that the state is revisiting whether the interpretation of the 90-day rule was appropriate, adding that the state could also potentially open up a new application process for the eight remaining slots, but nothing will happen unless and until the county takes action, she said. So... That's kind of conflicting right there in itself. So she's leaving it up to the state. She says the state can take action, and the but they not. won't unless the county does. And the so. county had already taken the action, and uh, the deputy director for uh, the Division of Public Health 
I cannot get her name correct in my head right now. She said, as it stands right now, there are no licenses to approve or appoint for the county of Clark. That's right. Uh, Laura Free, Deputy, Deputy Administrator of the Division of Public and Behavioral Health, said that, uh, let's see, said in a statement that her agency is going to need to evaluate the county's denials and determine if any dispensaries with provisional state approval have, quote, exhausted all of their appeal rights within the county, end quote. And that's what caught my attention. And um, that in, in the article that I that I have for our upcoming newsletter, I, I talk about that. You know, when they laid out the process, Kurt, as you recall, we asked, what is the appeal process if these people get denied? And there was not any appeal process laid out in the zoning. So it's going to be curious. And unfortunately, you know, we as taxpayers in Clark County are going to have to pay more money because of the lawsuits that are going to continue to evolve from this growing situation. Right. And now it goes even further and says that as for opening up, as for opening up the state's application process, that cannot happen until 2015 with the 45 day notice required by law. And to uh, dovetail on that, Chief Deputy Attorney General Linda Anderson stated that the state cannot grant new licenses because the law only gave it 90 days to review applications. She continued, that period has ended. <laughs> yeah, this is ridiculous. This is a mess. Yeah, I mean, the, the state did everything the way they said they were going to do it. And, you know, the county jumped in there and tried to change that. And now we got this this big old rat's nest here happening because of it. Um, I, I agree. There's The state shouldn't issue more licenses. They've already gone through their blind things with uh, non-identified binders, judging applications when they didn't know who they were, who the people involved with it were, just based on the merit of the application itself. And it shows the 18 best applicants. Now, if one or two of those didn't meet because of their zoning or whatever, that's understandable. But and, and that's the thing that each county commissioner, as they took their time to speak yesterday, they kept touting how transparent their process was. And I called Chairman Sislak out. I said, sir, you yourself acknowledged you changed the rules in the middle of the process. Because if you recall, Commissioner Sislak said, we are not going to change the rules again. Meaning you changed them after the process had started. Or, so, or how about uh, denying people because they just approved one right by that? I mean, how was that fair to the person who came second? Well, Sisolak went on to say that he hopes that the state will take action, but notes that in the worst case scenario, patients will still have the 10 dispensaries in the unincorporated Clark County area. So, you know, that, silver that, lining. Right. And you're absolutely right, Perry. You are absolutely right. And we, we, we should not negate that fact is that, yes, there will still be. 10 dispensaries in Clark County. However, the commissioners pulled a power play and they yanked eight additional dispensaries from other communities. Now those communities will not have access to those dispensaries as promised, as outlined in the law. Yeah. What about the tax revenue too? What about the jobs? There's so many ancillary mm -hmm. issues surrounding this. And once again, the legislative session is coming up. And as I continue to state every week, we promised them all this revenue and all these jobs and all this, and we got nothing to show so far. Yeah. And so I've heard whispers about, oh, you know, there are shops open. Euphoria Wellness is supposedly going to open January 12th and all that. But I haven't heard that final approval has been given to any of these testing labs yet. And as far as I'm aware, they can't get the medicine on the shelf until the testing labs are approved. Everything's been approved by the state. All, all, the, all the labs. What about the local? All the labs are ready to roll. All the they're labs have been approved. Already? I don't know if they're already open, but anybody that's applied to have a testing facility in the state, right. they've already received their state approval. Where they were at, and see, that's the unfortunate thing is when they were having all these hearings and everything, you know, they're shaking the hand this way, so you're not paying attention to what's going on over here. Our attention was focused on the cultivation. Our attention was on the dispensary. We want to make sure that our patients have quality medication and safe access to acquiring that medication and unfortunately we did not well i'm, I'm not putting it on anybody else unfortunately i personally did not pay enough attention to the testing facility issue as i should have oh none of us did it kind of got swept under and just kind of got uh i don't want to say ignored but it wasn't a primary uh concern of most investors just because they didn't think there was enough like uh the 
more most money in it compared yeah, it's, to it's, uh, it's, I think there was a state law saying that you couldn't be involved in any other part of the business yeah, if you exactly. had your if, if you're into a part lab. of a testing lab you can't be on a dispensary or yeah, a grower I think that or, scared away a lot anything. of people but you know I've talked to a few people who did get their testing licenses and everything seems to be smooth sailing with them and I believe the testing is going to be up and open um, there's not there's not as much to that as there is in cultivation and all the other things that go Let's along hope with so. It. I'm just being devil's advocate. I just want to see all these pieces fall into place so that we can get these shops finally open and get this rolling. Absolutely. And we, we um, need to make sure that we have a good turnaround time on from when the product is submitted to testing facilities to the patients being to, able to acquire it on, on from the dispensaries. I've heard it's a day, maybe two. Yeah, some, usually, some usually one quick. day. Usually yeah. one day on testing. That uh, seems to be standard across the nation. So. All right, then good. So, right you got any uh, other local news for us? Oh, Terry? just a little blurb from Mesquite. Uh, Congressman Hardy is holding a town hall meeting tomorrow of all days on New Year's Eve at 9 a.m. He's holding a town hall meeting in Mesquite at the City Council Chambers at City Hall, 10 East Mesquite Boulevard. And according to his staff, he just wants to meet with the Mesquite residents to hear their views before he begins his uh, congressional term to hear them out and. You know, see what uh, see what they want him to do on their behalf while he's in DC, I guess. So, uh, I mean, that's about it. Not more any, no more news than that from Mesquite. That's it. Just show up at 9 a.m. at uh, at City Hall in Mesquite if you want to talk to him. All right, New Year's Eve day. If you have nothing else to do tomorrow, that's why I said New Year's Eve day. That sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to, to, tomorrow uh, the the people who put on Las Vegas Hemp Fest are back in town, and they're throwing Hempy New Year's Eve party in Las Vegas down at the uh, at the Arts Factory, uh, and uh, it's only it's only ten dollars for those of you who can't afford a lot of money. And there's going to be some great music out there. Weekend's going to have a booth, and we have tickets that we're giving away too. That's right. We have uh, we have some tickets that we're going to give away. So listen for the uh, Spicoli sound and the first two callers that call in when uh, he, we hear Jeff Spicoli. I'm so wasted. <laughs> we'll receive a pair of tickets each to Hempy New Year tomorrow night. And in case you missed that number from the opening, that's 702-731-1230. 702 731 one twelve thirty or eight six six eight two zero five five two eight. So it should be a lot of fun out there, but make sure you dress warm because it's pretty cold out there. Guys. Yeah, yeah, it's no supposed doubt. to get snow. Well, you know, I think they're backpedaling on that a little bit. The weather guy earlier in the week, they're like, oh, we're going to have snow for sure, 70% chance. And they're like, oh, maybe it's 20, 30-ish. I just hope it doesn't rain. Like if it snows, I, I can deal with the snow, but that freezing rain is just unbearable. So, you know, I, uh, and I hope it doesn't interfere with the uh, potential fireworks show that they have scheduled because it's supposed to be pretty uh, pretty spectacular this year. I think they're setting off 80,000 fireworks between the 15 properties. Wow. So it should be uh, quite a show. But it's like Kurt was saying, if you don't want to deal with all that strep nonsense, you should definitely come hang out with us down at the Arts Factory at the uh, Bar and Bistro at 7 p.m. is when the party kicks off. It's only 10 bucks to get in, and they'll have some pretty – pretty chill musical acts from what i've been reading on the lineup so and don't forget be responsible there's going to be free bus rides from 6 p.m that. to 9 a.m so those of you that choose to partake in alcohol please use wise choices i also believe that AAA is offering their free tipsy toe service if you call tipsy toe or the designated drivers and things like that definitely get home safe yeah, so there's a lot of options for those that may be medicating, those that may be drinking, or whatever the case may be. Exactly. Please, like I said, just just use wise choices. You know, we don't, we would hate to lose anybody while we're celebrating uh, a new year. Yep. I'd like to go back. Uh, we were talking about the the tax money and all that stuff that would be lost uh, because of these eight dispensaries that didn't get open, which I know North Las Vegas is upset about now because they took six away from them and. They were probably the easiest going people when it came to getting licenses. Those there, those six would have opened up no problem. But, but there was uh, just a news, uh, uh, just news reported in national news: uh, marijuana industry to create two hundred thousand jobs in twenty fifteen and generate two billion dollars by twenty twenty. So, two hundred thousand jobs. Two hundred thousand jobs next year is Holy what they uh, estimate the marijuana industry is going to create. Well, uh, that's just not in Nevada. That's nationwide. Well, no, of course that's nationwide, and that's fantastic. And what people you know, fail to realize sometimes is, you know, we weren't affected by the uh, economic collapse of two thousand eight. This whole industry has kind of come after that. We're not replacing lost jobs. We're creating new ones. So you know, this is definitely a, a great thing. 
Yeah, absolutely. The the uh, we're having a job fair on uh, January twenty fifth for people to come out and uh, apply for these positions. We have a few of the growers. We have a dispensary. We have a few dispensary uh, companies, and that that are going to be presenting there. And these uh, it's on January twenty fifth, and these businesses should be opening up very soon in January and February. So this is the big one to be at. For those of you that forget, that's at one from one thirty to five p.m. Sunday, January 25th. It'll be our third job expo, and it'll be at the uh, Flamingo Clark County Library on Flamingo Road. And uh, please make it out to see us there. And also beyond that, I almost forgot. We have a first Friday. Uh, I almost forgot that uh, this Friday is first Friday, the second. So we will have a booth at uh, the Arts Factory downtown, like we always do. Same same bad time, same bad channel. Yep, we'll be down, we'll be down there in front of the Arts Factory. <laughs> on a Friday night and we'll be at the artifice tomorrow night. So we got a busy week ahead. We got a busy week ahead. Okay, uh we have um going out of our local news for right now, over in Washington D C a marijuana legalization opponent is being banned from D C businesses. Uh Republican representative Andy Harris. Boo is trying everything he can to prevent marijuana legalization from being implemented in Washington, D.C., despite the fact that the initiative passed by an overwhelming margin on Election Day. Harris isn't even from D.C. He's from Maryland. Um, and his actions have resulted in some D.C. businesses banning the politician from doing business with them. This is from the Washington Post. The move so infuriated district residents, and we're not talking about Democrats or anybody, we're talking about the residents of this community, that someone has started a blacklist Andy Harris Tumblr asking for local service businesses not to serve him. I love it. My fellow Washingtonians, Rep Representative Andy Harris doesn't give a blank about district residents or our rights, so let's blacklist him. We can generate and distribute signs, stickers, posters with his face words like persona non grata and ask local businesses to display them. We can also put up signs with a similar message all around the district. I like that. I think it's the least they could do considering how uh, how much he decided to stick his nose in everyone else's business. The least we can do is attempt to make his life a little bit right. a little I mean, more difficult. He's not even their elected yeah, official. Not even his, they're not even his constituents. What is he <laughs> I'm, I, I don't even trying want to force to, his it, hand? It's just stories like that make my eye twitch. I get so upset, literally. It's just, it just drives me nuts. It really just spits in the face of our democratic process, the will of the people. I can go on and on. And, you know, Republicans say that, oh, as a Republican, it really gets my goat because you're supposed to be about, you know, small government and keeping your nose out of people's personal lives. And here you are sticking your nose in people's personal life for a personal vendetta. It makes me sick. And uh, unfortunately, we, it's, uh, it's break time here. And we'll be back after the 420 moment. We have Jeff Black from the Reno NAACP as our guest. So uh, stick with Blank. us. Do you need help getting your Nevada medical marijuana card? Dr. Reefer is now accepting new patients. There are no medical records required we have of doctor on staff to give you a thorough physical examination. There is a 99% approval rate for patients. They also have a money back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Free consultation is available. Call 702-428-0000. 702-428-0000. To get your Nevada Medical Marijuana card today. You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702 218 5226 or Kurt, K U R T, at WeCan 702.org. Green Spot Hydroponics is a Las Vegas-based distributor of specialty indoor and outdoor gardening supplies, locally owned and operated with over 3,000 square feet of inventory. Expert and friendly staff to help you with all your growing and hydroponic needs. Our pricing and service will not be beat. We help you grow. 3355 Westlake Mead Boulevard, just behind the Texas station. Mention we can and receive 10% off. Call us at 702-463-6000. That's 702-463-6000. Ha, 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 ha. 
<laughs> Welcome back to the show. That uh, sound indicates that it's time for our 420 moment of the week, and this week we'll be honoring Matthew McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey is a famous actor. He was born on November 4th, 1969, and uh, he first gained notoriety for his breakout role in the coming-of-age comedy Dazed and Confused, which came out in 1993. I mean, we all remember that. It was a great uh, stoner movie, I guess. And uh, he went on to perform in a bunch of, you know, non- stoner movies like you know Amistad and Contact, Ed TV, U five seven one, and then he moved into a bunch of other romantic style comedies before he came back more recently and played roles like you know the Dallas Buyers Club, which he got a lot of accolades for and things like that. And he's a more serious actor now. But regardless of all that, he's always been a big supporter of cannabis outside of his dazed and confused days. I think he kind of does a little bit of activism in his private life, which is why we're honoring yeah, him today. He, he's been uh, living the high life as a cannabis enthusiast uh, for a long time now. And just early this year, Jimmy Kimmel roasted uh, Matthew McConaughey said, and said he doesn't even own a television. Kimmel continued that he knows <laughs> and for a fact that McConaughey, McConaughey traded his TV for a conch shell full of weed. <laughs> Sounds like a fair trade to me. Yeah. You'll get much more use out of the weed. I think the thing that that uh, that a lot of people forget about was back in uh, 1999 when uh, the police were called to his house for uh, for uh, disturbing the peace. And when they arrived, they found McConaughey dancing around in the buff and playing bongo drums. <laughs> so that was uh, that was uh, probably not one of the high points of his career, but you know. <laughs> Well, you know, they say there's no such thing as bad publicity either, and he seems to have done pretty well for himself, regardless of his uh, his wild ways back when he back a few and, years ago. And and he was in his own home doing, you know, what he yeah. wanted to do. So, you know, just exactly. unfortunately, the bongos upset his neighbors, and I think he was in Texas <laughs> when that went down, also. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we have our guest on the phone. We have uh, Jeff Blank. Is it That's correct? Blank. Yep, from the Reno NAACP. How you doing, Jeff? Oh, pretty good. It snowed up here today, so keep it warm. Ah, it snowed up there. So, yeah, they, they had uh, some rumors of some snows in Vegas uh, tomorrow, but it looks like it might not happen. <laughs> so, so, Jeff, you, you've jumped into the debate on um, the legal, straight-up legalization, not the medical side, of uh, marijuana. Correct. T tell, why don't you tell us in your own words um, why? Well, this came... Um we look at law enforcement issues regarding drug possession and from a black person's perspective you're much more likely well in nevada you're almost five times as likely to be arrested for marijuana possession than if you're white and one way to get rid of this disparity is well we can you know educate the police forces and, and, and the population and try to stop it the other looked at it said it's a waste of taxpayers money to be arresting people for the, for possession anyway so back in September, I wrote a letter to everyone who was at that time in the Nevada State Legislature from the, on behalf of the NAACP saying, look, legalize it and end this disparate treatment of black people. Um, and also you can save the state over $40 million a year that they're spending on enforcement of marijuana possession laws. Hmm. Hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I could continue there, you know, because what else, the other thing I told them in the letter <laughs> was basically said historically you know when marijuana was put on the dangerous drug list it was improperly done so i think the american medical association said it wasn't a dangerous drug but they put it on anyway yeah it was it was put on there against the recommendation of the ama so. yeah and it, and 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 if you look back and you and you think about it it's like back in when it was 1920s or whatever else you know the white population wasn't smoking a lot of marijuana it was uh, more people of color more hispanics and so they're like fine you know, I think there was a racial issue back then because back then the KKK was thriving. You know, President Wilson you know, just came out and he was one of the, he was a flaming racist, you know, and segregated the federal government. So in any event, they put it on the list. And now we have the, you know, over the past 20 plus years, the war on drugs. And, you know, this war on drugs is just really a war on, on, on the working Americans and people of color. Our prison population has gone from 200,000 in the 1970s to now over 2 million. Oh, my God. We have the largest prison population of any country in the world, more than China. Well, you know, are you and, talking and, about for drug use or are you talking about no, overall? Yeah, total, total, but the growth mm. from 200,000 to 2 million, the, the, the majority of the growth is the war on drugs and possession. We're, we're, we're throwing people in, into prison for possession of drugs. Yeah, and a lot of the people in prison are also in there for violating probation after they get out for using cannabis. Yeah, the system right. keeps yeah, them I in. Mean, yeah. 
and the cost, they said uh, there was a study done by the ACLU back a few years back that said the cost to Nevada for drug enforcement was over it was about 41 million of marijuana drug possession enforcement and also that Nevada I think this is in 2013 report it stated there were 9000 over 9000 arrests for possession of marijuana in Nevada putting us as one of the highest in the nation and that was an increase of 96% over the past 20 years for enforcement of marijuana possession, also one of the highest in the nation. So Nevada's becoming, you know, <laughs> pushing for the top for the wrong reasons and on the wrong cause. Right. Nevada has um, always been on the wrong side of that, unfortunately. I think, you know, you remember the 20 to life signs for possession back in the day, and, you know, they take it pretty seriously. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's gone away. But, you know, can you imagine if we spent that money enforcing real crime? I mean, even real drug use, like, you know, the, the methamphetamine problems that we have here in the state of Nevada and all the prescription pills. I've lived in this state for 23 years, and I've known so many people's lives that were destroyed by crystal meth and, and prescription pills. Lower tabs is the number one, I think. It's just, well, and it, yeah, and you can look at it and say, you know, just spend the money, you know, on, on anything that's constructive. The other is you know, education, because if you look at uh, some of the other countries, the Netherlands, I think Spain's looking at it, of legalizing possession of any drug, just possession, you know, and personal use, right. saying, you know, we used to have, I and mean, we still, it still is an issue, but the use of cigarettes in the United States has dropped dramatically. Not because we threw cigarette users in prison, we educated them. <laughs> you know, so if <laughs> you, 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 you educate them and say, this is not a healthy thing to do, you know, pretty soon they got the message. Jeff, when the legislature convenes in February, as you know, they'll have the first 40 days to do something with the recreational uh, ballot initiative that was uh, the signatures uh, collected by Nevada Cannabis Industry Association. Uh, are you optimistic that the legislature will, in fact, pick up this issue, or do you think that it will go to a 2016 general elect election ballot initiative? Well, I'd like to be pleasantly surprised that they took it up. <laughs> right, same here. <laughs> In other words, you know, we elect these people to lead. And I think what the ballot initiatives do is it, it takes the poli you know, the elected officials off the hook. Oh, I don't have to make I don't have to I don't have to take a position because it's going to be on the ballot. I'm like, "No, take the take the lead. You know, go towards legalizing recreational use." Like I think I, I heard you talking on the show earlier. I mean, the number of jobs to be created, the you know the revenue stream, and Nevada's hurting for money. I'm like, if you know, look, we have legalized prostitution, legalized gambling, legalized marijuana isn't a big leap. You're right. Will the NAACP be taking an active part in the legislation? Well, that's why I wrote the letter early because uh, I've been involved, try to be involved with the legislature, our local branch. We can't afford a lobbyist, so we, we, we work with other groups to hear what's going on. And the problem with this 120-day legislature is if you don't live down there, you can miss things. No so doubt. we're going to be involved and try to you know let people know this is our position and this is what should be done. And we'll be contacting people again. But it's really, I mean, it's almost like herding cats. You know, That's a good to way to put to the it. Legislature. Yeah, well, well uh, at weekend we try to make a few tr trips up there every session and meet then and get up there for the key things and as you say not living up there makes it really difficult because you go up there for you know four or five days and then you have to come back and and you know well that being said we were touching on this before the show and we were talking about how how swamped our legislators are because we do only have a 120 day window every two years would you be in support of expanding that to possibly doing it every year or maybe even eventually moving to a full-time legislative session to address the needs of the state on a full-time you know base or a permanent full-time basis Yes, I think, you know, when you were, when things were really small and simple, you know, you know, it made sense. I think those small and simple days, you know, are up gone by the wayside. I'm not sure if we're the only one left or one of two states that, you know, doesn't meet on, a, on an annual basis. Oh, wow. You know, it's, it's, you know, and it's obviously, you know, Nevada's population is not huge, but... Um, uh, I didn't realize we were in such the minority. I didn't realize we were one of only two left. I thought maybe there was not a dozen I'm not sure about that, but... Most every other legislature decided to meet every year just to meet the needs of the people. <laughs> you know, it's, things come up, and now we have interim committees, and, and getting notices and trying to show up for those is difficult. And, and I mean, I showed up last session to try to speak, uh, you know, on a topic, 
I think it was on uh, the gay marriage ban, what, what they were doing, things of that nature. I mean, I had to wait. I, I sat around for an hour and a half, you know, to speak for 30 seconds. And it's like, well, gee, you know, who, who's got the time, you know, give up their day job to go, you know, unless you're a full-time lobbyist. Yeah, we've had uh, problems with that here in Las Vegas. I mean, you're, I'm sure you're, you, that's not the first time that's happened to you. We had people fly in from uh, California and up north and to come down to a city council meeting, and basically we got chewed out of there before we even got a chance to speak. And uh, and there's been times I've gone to go speak on a topic and ended up sitting there for six hours listening to them talk about a stadium. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and on a state level too. You know, you go to these committee meetings and it's the same story. So, you know, we're sorry you had to go through that, but we're all fighting the. Uh, fighting the battles one at a time as we as we can i suppose well, Jeff, no and it's not unique but yeah yeah go ahead uh as, as you know uh, not everyone is agreeing with you on the legalization for example retiring washoe county district attorney gamick is uh staunchly opposed and he states and i'm quoting from him as far as i'm concerned let's never do do it referring to legalizing because it is a dangerous drug what do you say to people that want to use the argument that cannabis is a dangerous drug? I just tell them that, that you know they've been lied to and their facts are incorrect. Absolutely, uh, it's not. You know, it's just simply it isn't true. And uh, you know, and, and 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 Dick Gamak's statement. I think he said, you know, it's the drug. It's getting into the hands of kids and parents and showing up at schools. And I'm like, well, okay, so is alcohol and guns. So you want right. to outlaw those too? Uh, you know, let's be consistent here. Um, and it's him just saying that it's, you know, it's dangerous. It's like, you know, he's entitled to his opinion, but he's not entitled to his own facts. You're <laughs> right. And, and his facts are certainly incorrect. He's claiming that he has a 150 page report out of the Office of Justice on Colorado. And they are having, and I'm quoting from uh, DA Gamak here, they're having children OD on the stuff. Now, I've, I've been involved with cannabis probably, I'd say, nearly two decades. So in that two decades, never one time have I ever heard. Look, I'm sure he has some beachfront property in Arizona he'd like to try to sell you to feed me <laughs> that yeah. kind of crap. Yeah, I mean, he's so o full of that marijuana, design. it's like that's not even one of the listed possibilities, you know, of side effects yeah. or harm. This guy's I so mean, full of it, his eyes are turning brown. That's so ridiculous. I mean, I, it's like, yeah, it's kind of like, I mean, the fact that, you know, you know, maybe did they choke on it or something, you know, who knows? But, you know, it, it, it's not an overdose. He might be getting confused with spice. That's synthetic Well, that's stuff. what they Dead said. Possibly. They're like, oh, well, they're overdosing. You know, and these people open their pie holes. They should be informed before they decide to say something that's going to bite them in the ass and make them look stupid. And speaking well, of looking stupid, he says they're having children steal it from their grandparents and they're taking it to school and selling it. Okay. That's well, been going on for a long time. That'll happen. You know, yeah. And, yeah, and I'm like, kids have been stealing things from their parents you know, as, as long as there've been kids and parents, and, that's, know, a par that's a par a parenting issue. Absolutely. And you can, know, can you say that again, please? <laughs> it's a parenting issue. It's not a substance issue. That's right. Absolutely. You're absolutely you lock, right. Up, you lock up your guns. You lock up your drugs. Oh, My parents another, used to steal it from me. Oh, <laughs> issue. Uh, you know, people are like, oh, you know, it's a dangerous drug. It's like I think the most dangerous drug in the world is denial, the ability to look what's going on and ignore ignore the truth, regardless, just because you've been fed this disinformation for so long. I think. You know, the lies that we're feeding these children are more dangerous than, than the drugs that they're stealing from their parents, in theory. It's, it's terrible. It's just... Yeah, well, yeah, and the prescription drug abuse, you know, that, they have, they're stealing it from their parents. Yeah, so therefore, we should not have prescription drugs. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's well, like... According it to that, that logic. And, well, I've, yeah, I've, I've, and, I've brought it up at many council meetings that if they're so afraid of kids getting a hold of, of <laughs> cannabis and other drugs, why is, it man why is it not mandatory that all medicine cabinets come with locks? Well, yeah, it's, it's simple. I mean, and, and you take it to the extreme with weapons, yeah. you know, you lock up your weapons. You don't want your kids to have them. Right. I mean, it's, it's the same, you know, it's the same type of argument. It's like, you're right. If you leave it lying around in front of kids, they're going to use whatever it is. You know, it doesn't, you know, you, you can, I don't care what it is. It's, you know, even when your kids are toddlers, you don't leave a, you don't leave a knife on the table. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, no you, you do leave knives on the table, but you educate your children about the dangers of a knife, which right. is what we should be doing with, with cannabis, prescription drugs, and other things. Not, not leading them through fear, leading them through education. You're absolutely oh, yeah. right on that, because um, 
I have a friend who, who uses medical cannabis and, and has children. And the children help him with his garden and everything else, and they are educated in it. They're educated that this is medication. This is not something that you use willfully. It's you, you, you know. Oh, yeah. I have a, fr- right, I have a relative them. who recently kind of came over and is like, look, Perry, you know, I have brain cancer, and I'm trying to get on cannabis oil for the first time and this and that. And, you know, I don't want to smoke it because I don't know what to tell my kids. What will I tell my kids? And I told them, well, tell them the truth. You're taking your medicine. Like, why, you know, what do you have to hide from them? This is the only thing I found that helps. Yeah. You know, what's well, so hard yeah, about and that, that? And that's incredible. For, I mean, the fact that even even being prescribed by a doctor, you still can't get it. And I'm just like, <laughs> you know, I don't understand that because, you know, if you, if you go to the hospital, you get morphine, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's completely, that's that's okay. Morphine and Oxycontin and everything like that are completely Right, they're, are, they're okay, okay. But, but, can, but, but cannabis isn't. And I remember growing up in school, I was told, I mean, this is part of the thing was if you use marijuana, you're going to end up a heroin addict. Oh, well, you know, I, I, I've heard that, too. And I just think that's so hilarious. People tell me all the time, oh, you know, if you use cannabis, you won't amount to anything. Well, you know, uh, our last three sitting presidents have all admittedly smoked cannabis. And the two most successful Olympic athletes of all time, Michael Phelps and Usain Bolt, admittedly smoke cannabis. And it's just like that. All, it's like you said, the lies just stack on the lies and they just fall apart the house of cards falls apart apparently you know eventually on its own on its own yeah, and bs that, and that's the truth and then and then the legalization i'm going you know the netherlands hasn't fallen apart you <laughs> no, know they had legalized all. marijuana usage for years now they're doing just fine and actually the study i read about the netherlands was in the first year after legalization use went up and then every year since it's it's now lower than it was before it was legalized you know, so I, I've heard stats like that too. And, you know, it's uh, kind of like so. It's not like it's going to be. Oh, everyone's going to be smoking. You know, smoking pot all the time now. Well, I've had my uh, talks with my friends about this, and they think that that phenomena is due to the fact that people like to do what seems bad like if it seems like it's okay some of the sexiness is taken away from it and it just seems like anything else at that point like oh right. you know, uh, maybe maybe i'm totally off base with that but maybe there is something to that i don't know i'm not a psychologist no and i don't know you know but i, mean, I look at you know what's going on in the state of nevada you know and and, and what's happening and, and and you know i deal obviously a lot with the black community and people of color mm-hmm. and you know, back to what I stated up beginning with is, is, is like, yeah, you tell a black person, it's like, if your white friend says, oh, yeah, that, you know, I got stopped, but I didn't get arrested when, when they found marijuana, for a black person, it's four and a half times more likely you are going to be arrested. And I'm like, what? That's my tax dollars at work. You know, it's it's like, I don't want them spent that way. Well, yeah, nobody no, should no, be no. arrested. Oh, here, here, okay. I was on Facebook recently and uh, I was just kind of having a conversation with someone about, you know, recreational marijuana legalization and, and this and that. And the guy's like, oh, you know, I, uh, one of these police officers was just like, oh, I really don't want them, you know, wasting our time and wasting our money in their very short legislative session, spending their resources on legalizing people getting high. And I'm just like, man, you know, so I kind of put this little internet meme up and it said, oh, you know, there are over 800,000 untested rape kits in the United States that are sitting on shelves and drug te- and drug tests are tested within the first week of their reception, always. And I'm like, well, where are your priorities? And he's like, oh, well, Perry, uh, his response was Perry, um, uh, rape kits are very expensive to test and drug tests are cheap. Do the math. And I'm just like, you know, straight from the horse's mouth, as they say. You know, and that's really yeah. like I just couldn't believe that was the actual response they had given. And it's just this is the enforcement priorities. This is what they choose to do and what they don't choose to do. They don't investigate property crimes. If your house gets broken into, they're not going to come looking. But, you know, they will set up checkpoints to see, you know, if you have your seatbelt on or to see, you know, if you're if the pedestrians are walking across the street and you're going to go run and buy them or whatever. And like you said, prioritize the enforcement issues. When you come asking for extra tax dollars, I don't buy it because you're not using the resources that you have appropriately and like you said all these marijuana possession arrests regardless of our you know the laxing in the laws it's just insane so jeff will you sorry uh, for the rant <laughs> are you willing to help us in this legislative session as we work uh tirelessly to educate our elected officials on what the real facts are and not what the made-up reefer madness is sure because it's it's I mean, one thing we do through the NAACP is, is, is education is a cure to a lot of the problems, you know, that we face, whether, you know, discrimination-wise, you know, legalization, use, um, the amount of, of, of misinformation that gets put out there, 
um, and, and getting people to do things that are against their own interests is, is really amazing. When you think about, you know, why do people do some of these things or, or, or vote these ways? And, you know, what we're looking at for the legislative session, that's why I put the letter out there in September. Just, you know, kinda, I did get out in front of it a little bit saying, look, here's what our branch's position, here's the reasons, and here's the facts. You know, so don't say you don't know, because <laughs> we sent it to everybody. Now, I missed the ones that got bounced and the new ones elected, so I was thinking of, you know, we may send out another letter just at the beginning of the session going, hey, in case you didn't get the first one, right? And, and here, here it is. Certainly, we, we, we look forward to a, a collaboration on this issue, and hopefully, you know, by the time this legislative session is over, we'll be kicking back in the studio here celebrating, you know, some hard earned victories. Right. Yeah. Well, it'd be great because it'd be like, you know, and I'd, and I'd give kudos to the Nevada legislature for actually, you know, leading. <laughs> right. You know, getting something done that's, a, you know, fixing, you know, fixing a problem and creating a solution and, and doing something good for the state. Yes, indeed. Jeff, if, uh, if people want to find out more about the Reno Sparks branch of the NAACP, how do they go about that? You know, the, I think the. Um, the easiest way is, is our website, which is renosparksnaacp.org. All one word? Yes. Fantastic. All right, Jeff, we thank you very much for calling in. We're going to get ready to take our final break, and when we return, we're going to have some regional news. And hemp, Hempy Hemp Fest tickets. And Hempy New Year tickets. That's right. Stay tuned. Finally, Nevada medical marijuana dispensaries are opening, but you must have your medical marijuana card to get inside. Call the friendly team at Karma Holistic Health Foundation, toll free, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. Karma Holistic Health Foundation will give you legal access to medical marijuana. All veterans receive a discount, 855-420-1110, or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com you're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702 218 5226 or Kurt, K U R T, at WeCan702.org. Welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I'm Kurt Dukach, and in the studio with me, I have Raymond Fletcher, Beach BJ Baker, and Perry Haichu. And of course, Lauren's on the boards making us sound great. So uh, we're into the regional section of our news. I think regionally. I'm so wasted. There you go. Oh, there you go. That sound means it's time to call in for your Hempfest tickets. Call, callers New- 1 and 2. Hempy New Year tickets tomorrow night at 702 731 1230. That's right. Callers one and two will win Hempfest tic- or Hempy New Year tickets. Okay, so, what do you got for us regionally, Kurt? Well, I got a little something out of Arizona. Uh, hemp legalization initiative be- uh, in Arizona begins. So, uh, hemp is a very versatile plant. Once a time upon a time in America, hemp grew all over the place and was used for many things, including rope and uh, and clothing and and paper and we actually had hemp for victory before the war where the united states government was actually encouraging the people of the united states to grow hemp for the war i think at one point certain farmers were even required to grow it Mm -hmm. like certain amounts due to the i don't know if it was the war effort or just national security or whatever it was i know it was a staple in indiana's agriculture for a long time really yes well hopefully we can get back to uh having it be a staple of their of their uh agricultural industry again soon there very, was very a woman corn in indiana yeah. and we'll currently since probation we've had 
no hemp until just recently when uh, Kentucky filed for their, their hemp production and they got it. And I believe this year, Tick Siegerblum is introducing a bill in the legislature in Nevada for hemp for Nevada. Yeah, definitely. I would like to see that happen here. Uh, people say, oh, you know, where would you grow it? But there are a lot of decent places to grow it. There's a lot of groundwater all over Nevada. You could grow industrial hemp in, in a lot of good areas. I well, think it would just be a really fun, fun thing to pick up here in Nevada and to try. I mean, why not? That's one of the nice things about hemp is that it is real easy to grow and it grows just about anywhere. They and, grow it in Canada, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it was it was a staple of the United States government and the farmers of the people you know, that founded this country until prohibition came around. And it is a weed after all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, I got some. Uh, what we got over here? Oh, okay. I got a bunch of news from Alaska and Washington and Oregon all over. I guess I'll just start up north in Alaska, my second home. Uh Let's see. Fairbanks and Anchorage are going to take a hard look at marijuana in the lead up to legalization. The Fairbanks No Star Bureau is going to follow Anchorage in forming a working group to explore the legalization of marijuana in Alaska and crafting the laws specific to local commercial regulation. On Tuesday, the Anchorage Assembly's new committee on regulating and taxing the cultivation, manufacture, and commercial sale of marijuana met briefly to outline how it will work to craft marijuana laws in Alaska's largest city. And we got to come up with some better acronyms for these for these groups. These names are getting ridiculous for these works for these uh, study groups. Uh, Fairbanks North Star Borough Mayor Luke Hopkins said he would too be forming a working group to begin crafting ordinances addressing the legalization concerns to present to the Borough Assembly. Uh, in Anchorage, the four-person committee, which is chaired by West Anchorage Assembly member Ernie Hall, will be charged with developing and recommending new municipal code, et cetera, so on and so forth. Same thing that we had here. You know, people form the subcommittees, they try to work through the problems, and then they have recommendations, and that's where you'll see these public hearings and things like that. And it's uh, a lot of the same. It seems like if you could just take our stories from a couple of years ago and kind of place them in here, it's like the same, the same news. Case in point right here, the Alaska Bar Association weighs in on ethics of attorneys and pot. I remember telling this story not even that long ago about how the Nevada attorneys, oh, the bar, you know, is it is it ethical for attorneys to uh, yeah. advise their clients? Is it ethical for attorneys to be invested in these marijuana-related uh, businesses, etc.? So they're going through the same thing here, and the bar is taking the same the same beat as us. Oh well, we're gonna you know we're gonna table it, and then we're gonna approve it, and you know this is what you can do, this is what you can't do. But Brad Jerbic just went through that. The city attorney just went through that less than six months ago. See, there you go. It's just but he one didn't of those want to things. do his job, right? Now, let me jump in and cut you off right quick. We have our winners. We have Kurt and Haley, and then we have Haley on the line. Hello? Hi, guys. Hey, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. I was a first time listening today. I'm so excited. Thank you guys so much. Awesome. Right well, thank you for being a supporter. Thank you, guys. I can't wait for the next party. That's going to be a blast. For <laughs> sure. Oh, it's going to be fun. It's um, Raymond's birthday, I believe. Yes, the next yes. function is on my birthday. We should have a special birthday cake. Uh, <laughs> I think we'll have to work on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and make sure Thank there's plenty guys. of leftovers for him to take home, too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Haley, we got your information. We got uh, Kurt's information as well. Not the Kurt to my left. And we'll make sure that we uh, get the tickets to you. Don't forget to come down and say hi to us. I'll certainly be down there uh, having some fun. <laughs> yeah, All make right. sure to dress awesome. warm. It's going to be cold out there. Yeah, no doubt. got you guys. I just want to <clears throat> quickly just thank the guest on the show today. He was a very nice speaker, and it was very great hearing him. I thought he was also very good. I'm looking forward to having him back during session, hopefully, so we can uh, powwow about what's going on up north. Yeah, I'm, well, lo I'm looking forward to meeting with him up there and maybe trying to get yes. some stuff done with him. All right, cool. Thank you guys so much for everything you guys do. Uh, thank, thank you, you so you much, Haley. Again, congratulations <laughs> to Haley and Kurt for winning our Hempy New Year ticket. And we're going to return to Perry. My bad I cut you off, bro. But no, no, not at all. And uh, we were just talking about the ethics of attorneys in alaska attorneys doing their job because brad job. didn't want to do his well, and, but but this statement uh, that the bar laid out actually extended a little bit further they're like hey you know if you guys want to smoke recreational marijuana we're okay with that too you know and i just thought that was uh i just thought that was just you know wonderful that uh, they decided to uh, do that. Sorry, my phone just went ahead. And I'm not off putting anybody on blast, Perry. Put myself, but we're supposed to turn our phones off. On blast. I did put it on. Uh, I had uh, my alarm misset. Sorry about that, folks. It was that wasn't the 420 alarm, so you don't need no, that. It was not. It wasn't the 710 alarm either. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, here let's. Uh, now that I've kind of discussed the Alaska ethics, let's move on to Washington. Washington's new pot advertising rules are a 
buzzkill. Washington's new advertising rules are restricting and prohibiting a lot of storefront signage. You know, the people that are trying to open these businesses are really unhappy because they feel like they're being put at a disadvantage right away from being like, you know, you're driving by the place, you can barely see the sign. They just want to be recognized. We had issue once again, we had issues with this here in, here mm -hmm. in town. How big are the signs? Can you put them outside? Can they be neon signs? Can yeah, they be off the street? Can you put them on the city light posts, etc.? I mean, that a conversation went on for hours that day. So, yeah, can you know, can you advertise on the radio? You know, and, and, and I don't mean to be ageist here, but this is what happens when you have old fogies running things. I mean, you have the old 60s and 70s mindset, you know, and, and they're not as liberal as, you know, the parents may be, you know? Well, absolutely. Um, how do I put this? There's a lot of people who I've talked to that say that, you know, maybe taxing and regulating wasn't the way to go. Maybe decriminalizing should have been the way to go because of the lack of government influence on it. You keep them out of it and just let m people do what they were doing and just stop taking people to jail for it. And you avoid all of this nonsense Absolutely. that we're dealing with now. No. And there is definitely something to be said for that. But, you know, if it was me... I would think that we could work through the tax. I think we're smart enough to work through the tax and regulate system. But for Christ's sake, you know, you got to start somewhere. And uh, I think that maybe, you know, good arguments on both sides. Well, well, you're talking about government, and government always has to poke their nose and everything. And over in Colorado, they did a poll. Um, after marijuana legalization took hold, the estimated percent of regular cannabis users in the state jumped to the second highest level in the country, according to... New federal data. Of course. When, when asked, roughly one out of every eight, ooh, Coloradan over the age of 12 reported using marijuana in the previous month. Mm -hmm. Only Rhode Island topped Colorado in the percentage of residents who... Rhode Island? What? Yeah, right? Who reported using marijuana as frequently. The results come from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Uh, the information was gathered in 2012 and 2013. Uh, University of Carolina, uh, University of California, Lo Los Angeles, uh, Professor Mark Kleinman said that this is not surprising given what's going on on the medical side. For the 2011-2012 period, 10.4% of Coloradans uh, reported using it, and um, that jumped to 12.7 a 22 percent increase i, I think, think it's going to continue to jump for another year or so and then it'll taper off and probably start to fall back down that happens um you know i mean I inevitable of course we're going to see that here in nevada too just like liquor off. though when liquor once prohibition ended everybody sure. ran towards liquor once it became more readily available people tapered off you didn't have people using it as frequently uh, there's kind of an ancillary story I wanted to touch on regarding the Colorado thing. I'm going to I had a story about Oregon here, but I think I might save that for next week. Um, there was a story on the homeless youth that is flocking to Denver and the problems that that's starting to cause. Able-bodied homeless youth seeking, uh, you know, solace, I guess, in the new marijuana culture. And I kind of fear that if that becomes a serious problem, I don't think it's going to get to the point that San Francisco got to in the late 60s or anything, but it is a definite uptick in homeless activity in these recreational cannabis areas. So I'm, I wonder whether that's going to become like a, a societal you know, issue in the next couple of years, but we'll see. We'll have to see how it plays out before we can make a, a determination on that. But besides that, we're almost well, ready. I was going to say, let's see if we have Kurt, if yeah, Kurt has right, anything yeah, else right. before we uh, wrap it up. Yeah, announcements. Uh, well, we got our announcements, but I also have one other thing in entertainment about why Santa Claus was a stoner. There's an <laughs> urban legend that says that Santa Claus was a stroom tripping shaman because he flies across the globe on a sled powered by magical reindeer tossing the world presents. Um, <laughs> but if he has a park penchant for magical mushrooms, then he certainly has a penchant for kush because no man can eat a bag of shrooms without smoking a joint to settle his stomach. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So, uh, um, anyway, our, on to our announcements. Um, a happy New Year! Happy New, New Year's, Year's night. tomorrow night, 7 p.m. at the Bar and Bistro, 107 East Charleston, dead center of the Arts District. Ten bucks for the entry. Also, we have First Friday on Friday, weekend booth, same location, January 2nd, uh, the Artifice and the Arts Factory. Saturday, January 10th from 2 to 4 at the Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf across from UNLV. We'll have our Patients First meeting. And on Sunday, 
January 18th, our monthly, pot, our monthly potluck on Raymond's birthday. Uh, my birthday and the 25th, we're going to have our third job fair. Uh, like us on Facebook. Uh, Happy, New meet up. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.